Okay, so I just got the message that we are live. Welcome everyone to the lunch panel. I'm your host, Boo Milton. I will be the moderator for today. And on the behalf of Serve Louisiana, Dialogue on Race and Humanities, and we want to welcome you to this panel. And um, this panel is about, you know, how past institutional racism impacts education today. And these panelists will speak on how they believe or what and what they believe are the most important things we need to consider to dismantle institutional racism in our community. And I mean, hey, if you're in this work, and I mean, even not because we're all, you know, affected by this, you know that structural violence is the worst type of violence. So we so we're gonna get into it. I wanna present our amazing panelists. And to be honest, I'm I'm gonna read some bios, but it honestly does not do them justice for all the work that they've done. So first, I want to uh, introduce Dr. Lisa Delphi, an acclaimed researcher, award-winning author, and brown, groundbreaking advocate for education access for students of color. I also want to introduce Dr. Press Robinson, a retired professor for Southern University and the first Black member of the East Baton Rouge Parish School Board. Also with us is Dr. Jose Avales, the LSU Vice President for Enrollment and has led teams from eight different colleges and universities that have successfully enrolled the most diverse and academically accomplished freshman classes in institutional history. So if I can get some comments, some snaps, some claps for all of our panelists, I want to thank you so much personally for paving the way uh, for young community organizers such as myself, everybody on the call. Thank you so much for what you have done. So. I guess it's time to get right into it. But before we do that, I do want to mention, please use the comment section to ask questions, um, engage, and we're we're going to pick some questions at the end and respond to them. So please use the chat feature uh, on the side or below. I'm not really sure where's that on your screen or mine is right there to the side. So please use it. All right. So I guess we're going to jump right into it with Dr. Robinson. So the last time you appeared on Day of Dialogue, you spoke of having regrets regarding desegregation in East Baton Rouge Parish school system. Is your regret that it was done at all or about the way it was done? Do you believe it was set up to fail? Um, you know, do you still uh, live with those impacts today? You know, what would you like us to know about desegregation then and now? Well, thank you, Boo. Uh, my pleasure to uh, be here again. Uh, I thoroughly enjoy my uh, opportunity to uh, uh, be present at this uh, panel discussion. But you know, my, my regrets uh, regarding desegregation in East Baton Rouge Parish primarily are twofold. First off, I would have preferred that equalization of resources would have been the main emphasis rather than desegregation. Let me remind us that at the time that uh, implementation of desegregation, black schools were well positioned in terms of qualified teachers. And I'm talking about well-trained uh, teachers, many who had masters or masters plus 30 degrees, uh, strong support of parents, and the community and teachers who lived in the students' community. Well, today, none of that is the case, except in very rare cases. Taking away these extremely important features, I think has led to an, at an atmosphere where education is no longer considered the true and tried pathway for improving one's life and a lot in life. Parents and teachers no longer see education as a necessity and thus do not emphasize it as my parents did and probably as the parents of generations right after mine also did. By basing the advancement of education upon equalizing resources, that would have solidified, I believe, the already solid base of black education in the parish. 
desegregation itself is perhaps not a bad idea, but the manner in which it was implemented certainly has not helped black education in the parish. And perhaps nowhere in this country or at best in a minimum of communities. White students would have sought out programs that they felt were important to them, no matter where they were located. And I spent a lot of my time trying to convince the East Baton Rouge Parish School Board that those programs should have been in predominantly all black schools and then white students would have gone to get those programs. But you couldn't put them in the black schools and then duplicate them in the white schools and expect the white students to then uh, migrate from their communities to schools that they didn't want to go to in the first place. But they didn't do that. So by not taking that approach, a system that was approximately 60% white, 40% black, consistent of approximately 60,000 students at the onset of desegregation was 83% black per a June 15, 2009 report that was presented to 20 experts from across the country who was reviewing East Baton Rouge Paris's accreditation. That is a far cry from what the parish's population reflected at that time, which was 56% white and 40% black. Now that same report listed only 10% of a now 44,000 student system as being white and 81% of these 44,000 students as eligible for reduced price meals. And I don't have to tell you who falls in that category. The parish school system had almost 43,000 students in 2013, more than 89% of whom were, were black students and an even greater percentage that lived in poverty. In 2020, state records show that the school system is down to 42,334 students, with 11% of those being white and 89% being black, while the parish as a whole is 45.97% white, 46.48% black. In addition, at present, I have no idea how many white and black students actually attend classes together in East Baton Rouge Parish or eat together in the cafeteria or socialize together. But I can guess not very many. So I ask, where is the desegregation? The statistics that I just indicated does not indicate that desegregation is a reality in this parish. I lay the blame for much of that change in demographics at the feet of the desegregation efforts. The failure of white leaders in Baton Rouge to reach an agreement on a desegregation plan that was reasonable, community-based, and absent forced busing would have made a major, major difference. The desegregation plan based on busing was unpopular in both the black and the white community. However, it initially earned a very sizable measure of support in the black community and the black kids got on the bus, went to the, the white schools. The white kids never rode the bus at all. Perhaps the crowning detrimental feature of the busing plan was that friends living across the street from each other were sent to different schools, a practice that angered both white and black students and parents. Placing strategic and strongly sought after magnet programs 
at the black schools, as I've already mentioned, would have produced far better results than the Boston plan. Board members, staff, and community persons, we all knew this. We all knew this, but yet the system chose to stick with the busing and they duplicated the magnet programs throughout the parish. Deliberate, you bet it was. Remember, George Davs, a city councilman at the time, appeared on television declaring that it, the busing desegregation plan, will never happen. And from where I sit, it has not, as indicated by the statistics that I quoted a bit earlier. Well, Dav's rant was just a continuation of the official attitude of the state of Louisiana, as stated by Governor Earl Long. And I quote, as long as I am governor of this state, we are going to keep the colored people out of our public schools. Well, we have moved from a large, fairly well-funded school system to a much smaller system on a constant siege by efforts to divert public funds to private schools. And at the time, efforts by a number of groups to just simply make money at the expense of children's education. And you can tell I'm talking primarily here about charter schools and other private schools. East Baton Rouge Parish School System currently has eight district authorized charter schools, four state authorized charter schools, 20 scholarship non-public schools, and a total of 40 nine non-public schools. It was my observation during the school board days that many of the students attending these schools actually didn't perform any better than the, the kids in the uh, public schools. And in many cases, less than the public school students. The difference, of course, is that these non-public schools siphoned off funds from the public schools often return students to the public schools, but they kept the monies. All these kinds of actions are deliberate and they denigrate public education. In other words, the detrimental effects of desegregation are playing out today, every day. And as time moves on, the effects are becoming more and more pronounced. I told you in 2013 that desegregation was probably the worst thing that happened to black people since slavery. And I am of that same opinion today. July the 4th, 2007 was supposed to mark the official end of the East Baton Rouge Parish desegregation case, but it did not end the fight against desegregation. And the assault continues in Baton Rouge today as exemplified by the proposed creation, I believe, of the St. George uh, City and its new school district, separate from the East Baton Rouge Parish Schools. The city and school system are to be located in one of the whitest, most affluent sections of the parish. If these efforts are successful, there will be a further drain of the parish's white students and one of its most important tax bases. That would leave the city of Baton Rouge and its students with even fewer resources. Now, researchers say that the St. George effort is part of a national trend of splinter school districts, worsening segregation and racial disparities across the South. Well, in Baton Rouge, the proposal has brought to the fore the parish's legacy of school segregation since 1956. Folks, that's 64 years of fighting desegregation. 
and still continuing. In 2007, Reverend Mary Moody said, let us continue to build on the past, live in the present and prepare for the future. My question is, did we ever reach the future? Or did we never leave the past? What I would like to know about desegregation then and now is, after 64 years, what has changed? And has there been any improvement? Now seems just like then, except that there's no lawsuit and no cry for desegregation. But after all, the system is supposed to be desegregated already. I don't think it is. Wow. Thank you uh, so much for that. That was um, that was very eye opening. Uh, I never um, embraced it from that perspective. Um, thank you so much for that. Um, and, and I've been seeing pe people in the comments you know, uh, giving the praises and, 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 and the amens to uh, to everything. So, man, thank you everybody for being being engaged and really uh, hearing everything out. Um, I want to keep the conversation moving the time uh so once again thank you so so much for the, for that um i want to move on to dr delphi um with all that's being said about you know um d de desegregation and classrooms and you know as a school boy as a whole but also like how does how does racism how has racism affected what happens in classrooms today You're still on mute. Yeah, now you get it. <laughs> Thank you, Boo, and thanks for having me here. Um, may have some connectivity problems I've been uh, seeing, so let me know if it stops. Um, well, there's a lot that I have to say on the subject, so I'll try to cut it short. But let's start with saying Beverly Tatum says that if you live in Los Angeles, you breathe smog. You don't want to breathe smog. You don't choose to breathe smog. It's not something you say, OK, I'm going to go out and breathe some smog today. You just breathe it. And she says if you live in the United States of America, you breathe racism. You don't intend to breathe it. You don't want to breathe it. It just happens. And whether we want to believe it or not, part of our subconscious or maybe sometimes conscious mind holds a story about African that whispers in our ears constantly. Things like African Americans are violent, unmotivated students, uncaring parents, less intelligent, hypersexual, lazy, dirty, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So how do I know this? Well, I do have a set of quotes that I, in a longer presentation, I would present over the history of the United States. But you can also, for today, take a look at Harvard's implicit association test, the IAT test, which you can take yourself online. And it measures the unconscious beliefs that we have about different ethnicities, genders, uh, ages, races, et cetera. The research that they've collected at Harvard shows that 76% of white and Asians show a decided preference of whites over blacks. But I have to add that 26% of black people also show a preference of whites over blacks. And this lets us all know that we're all breathing in the smog of racism. If you want to know more, you can take a look at Jennifer Eberhardt's wonderful book called Biased, where she shows through excruciatingly detailed research how negative attitudes about Black people permeate every aspect of our uh, existence in this country. I also know this because a Brookings Institute study shows that many of us cannot even see through the racial by the fog and smog of racism. 
when res uh, American respondents were asked how much of the difference in test scores between black and white students can be explained by discrimination against blacks or social injustice in society, nearly half, 44% of respondents said none. So racism does not explain anything about uh, black children's underachievement. Only 10% chose a great deal. So 44% of those questions dismiss totally racial injustice, despite centuries of enslavement, including anti-literacy laws, all that uh, Dr. Robinson has expressed about what has happened in schools, Jim Crow laws, lack of funding for Black education, the de jure seg segregation of yesterday and the de facto segregation of both bodies and resources today. Again, referencing um, Dr. Robinson. Not to mention the current and previous existence of uh, zoning po exclusionary zoning policies that keep families that can't afford single family homes out of high performing school districts, policies that prevent black wealth uh, accumulation, mass incarceration, um, job force inequities that ensure that white and black job seekers too frequently have differential hiring. And then within the direct purview of the schools, policies and practices have continued this societal structural racism, like excessive discipline policies for, that produce greater punishments for African-American students than for white students for the same offenses the use of policing, police bringing, being brought in to schools to monitor and arrest African-American students. Uh, black students have significantly lower opportunities for advanced coursework, fewer and fewer opportunities to have teachers who look like themselves, attendance boundaries that erect barriers to desirable schools, and test-based accountability that stack the deck against high poverty schools by emphasizing student proficiency over student growth. And yet almost half of those questioned in the Brooking study believe that none of the difference in scores between black and white students is due to discrimination against black people. 44% of the respondents believe the scores of black children are lower than white children because of some fault of the children or their parents or some inherent, something inherent in them and has nothing to do with the widespread fog of smog of stru structural racism. So uh, disconnected a bit and you- um, I think you're back you now. Okay. To give you just a few examples of how this affects classrooms, uh, students internalize them, students themselves internalize smog and question their own abilities. Uh, one of the books that, recent books that I wrote, is called Multiplication is for White People. And that title comes from a child saying to her tutor, so Miss L, black people don't, why are you trying to teach me this? Black people don't multiply, black people just add and subtract, white people multiply. Now, obviously nobody has ever said this to this child, but she has internalized this from the larger society that we live in and from what goes on in school. Uh, also, one of my grad students at um, Southern who has a, very, a science teacher, she has a very high expectation and, and she teaches wonderfully and has a lot of rigor for her students. And her students said to her, what you trying to do, Miss Antoine? Why are you trying to teach us this, this baker? So clearly the kids themselves have internalized some notion that they are less than. And exacerbating the problem, Teachers are also affected by the smog of racism and racial stereotypes. Teachers often subconsciously tend to expect bad behavior from black students. A Yale study had teachers watch videos of preschoolers and ask them to identify students who might become behavior problems. They tracked the teacher's eye movements and what they found was that the teachers focused most of their attention on black males. This kind of hypervigilance on black boys is probably what has led to a suspension rate of black preschoolers that is 360% times 
the rate of white preschoolers, even when the children are behaving similarly. There's also research evidence that teachers asked to rate students' academic abilities scored black children far below white peers when the children had identical scores. This can only contribute to the underrepresentation of black students in gifted and advanced placement programs. There's considerable research that shows that black students fare better on tests, have lower dropout rates and higher college attendance when they have several black teachers. Are you cut? Say it again. I said you cut out again um, uh, when you said uh, the success rate of um, of of black men. Well, I'm sorry, uh, students with uh, when they have more black teachers. I want right. to say. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And Louisiana policies have continued to reduce the numbers of black teachers, uh, even though research has shown that raising um, Praxis cutoff scores has no effect on improving teacher quality or student performance. The only effect that it had, well, there are a couple of effects, but one of the effects it has is reducing the numbers of black teachers. And that's continuing and continuing and getting more and more of a problem as every year passes. Um, one of the major prerequisites of high performance in school for black children is that they have a sense of belonging, a sense that they belong to the club of scholars, that they belong to the teachers, that they belong to the school. Geneva Gay says black kids learn not from, not just from a teacher, but for a teacher. And we can see that when you see those little black kids who love their teacher saying, oh, Miss Johnson, Miss Johnson, I did your homework, your homework because I like you. Uh, they need teachers that they can build these kinds of relationships with. And they also need a curriculum that supports their identities and supports their learning. To break through the smog of racism, Black students and their teachers need to know an accurate description of their histories. They need to know the role of ancient, that ancient Africa played in having the first libraries and universities and educating uh, their Greek and other old world contemporaries about mathematics, science, everything uh, that we claim now that black kids can't do. The fact that many enslaved, they need to know that many enslaved Africans were actually more literate than their captors when they were captured. They need to know about the resistance and rebellion that is enslaved Africans uh, engaged in throughout uh, enslavement. They need to know about the post-slavery laws that essentially maintained slavery. Uh, the, they need to know about the wealthy communities that some African Americans were nevertheless able to build only to have them destroyed and burned to the ground by white racist mobs. They need to know about the role young black children and teenagers played in the civil rights movement. They need to know the many black scientists, mathematicians, writers, musicians, et cetera, et cetera, that have helped to shape our modern world. Our children and their teachers, black, white, and other, need to know the real history and the brilliance of African-Americans. African-American children need a curriculum where they can see themselves and where they feel they belong to school and that school belongs to them. Parents need this too. When a curriculum that connects black history and local communities is implemented, black parents all over the country become excited and they become engaged in the school. So we have to work on our curricular offerings to connect to African-American cultural and intellectual legacies. We have to embrace local communities uh, by connecting school to home, for example, presenting science lessons that ask children to explore community concerns and issues, conducting histories of local communities with the students, uh, using math and community context, presenting what is learned in school to community groups and to younger children. In short, and in conclusion, to reduce the effect of the racism smog that could otherwise distort our minds, we have to see our children as the brilliant beings they are with the history of brilliance they bring to our classrooms. And we have to gain the knowledge 
to be able to set the stage for the flowering of that brilliance by allowing them and us to see clearly what the smog of racism has been hiding. More than what you asked for, but there you go. Um, hey, but it was everything that I needed for sure. I, I mean, hey, I know um, every, a lot of other people can attest to that too. Um, that was great. Thank you so much for that. Uh, I really hope that this goes on YouTube or somewhere. I, I don't know because I, because I need to go back and watch all of them. Because, man, y'all have really, like, said, said some great things here. And, man, I'm inspired. So, um, like I said, I want to keep it moving. Thank you so much, Dr. Delphi. Uh, we're going to now go to Dr. Avalis. Um, How you doing over there, man? I'm doing all right. Oh, Good to be here. You, you're on mute. Yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah. Can you hear me? That's great. Glad to have you here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not yeah, we all good. We're all good. Can you hear? I got you. Yep. Sounds good. Okay, cool. So all right, so I'm gonna break down uh your questions um in a few different phases. So let's go. Okay, so you have a track record for the success of your holistic admissions program in eight universities, including LSU. With such a non-traditional program, how are you able to get universities that use traditional methods to agree to use this program? Well, let me just say to start that, you know, holistic admissions is really, it's not my program per se. Holistic admissions is a term that is used in the work of college admissions that simply says that we are at the point of application for a candidate, we are looking at the totality of the student's record at that point of application. And for LSU, it was new. But when you look across the country, 50 of, there's 50 flagship universities that exist, and only a small handful of about six institutions were not using a holistic approach to evaluating applicants. So LSU was really in that small handful of institutions that were not practicing the work of admissions that way. And so for me, philosophically, I just approach the work by being informed by research. And the research tells us very clearly that what a student does over the course of four years in high school is much more predictive about what's going to happen over the course of their time as a college student compared to what they do when they just sit for three hours to take the ACT. And in fact, the research also is very clear that college entrance exams like ACT or SAT have a direct correlation or link with family income and have shown biases against historically underrepresented students. Therefore, if you are interested in truly diversifying your campus and you are sincere about that, you cannot, as an admission or enrollment professional, rely and overemphasize an ACT or SAT as a single metric that determines the fate of a student's admission. That's if you're sincere about diversifying your campus. Now, at LSU, we've not only included the research that informs how we practice evaluating applicants so that we can expand or work on issues of access, but we're also re-engineering our approach to better support students that we have admitted to our campus. And so our mission is very clear. Our mission is to improve access to students and then to live out our promise and support their success when they're on our campus. So an example of that work is our Pre-Scholars Academy. Our Pre-Scholars Academy is fairly new, started about three years ago here at LSU, and it focuses on low-income first-generation students who historic or historically underrepresented students who show promise and potential to be successful at our institution despite having experienced social, economic, and educational disadvantages. So this program includes an intensive and immersive transitional bridge program to bring students onto campus three weeks before the fall semester and then creates adequate support mechanisms in, in the community, for this community, throughout the academic year. And these students are students who historically would not have been admitted at LSU. But through this initiative, we have expanded access, so these students can participate at LSU. And what has been phenomenal about this story 
is that these students who would have never historically had the opportunity to come to LSU, these students are exceeding the success rates of regularly admitted students. Their retention rates are higher. Their attempted credit load is higher. Their actual earned credits is higher. And their GPA is right on par with students who have historically been regularly admitted at LSU. So it's just phenomenal to see the students that would have never had the opportunity by looking at them more comprehensively or holistically and supporting them differently can actually excel at a higher rate than regularly admitted students. Oh, man, thank you so much for, for the work that you do in that light. Um, so what specifically about your program would you say has led to those results? And like, is there an expected timeline for these results? Well, here's the thing, but what, what's interesting is that and, and I love just being able to point out consistently, the students have not changed. These are the same students that have been coming out of Louisiana high school forever. And we've come to terms with the fact that a student's talent is not the same as a student's level of preparation. In this country, depending on the zip code that you grow in, you grew up in, your level of preparation is just going to be different. And it has all sorts of reasons for that under resource schools, a lot of the things that Dr. Delpick just, just alluded to, there are real issues in education. But what we know as higher education professionals, especially at public flagships like LSU, is that the status quo is no longer sustainable. It's like watching a car crash. You just sit on these campuses and you look at the car crash and you're okay with it because you're just watching a movie. It's time for us to jump in and start doing something about this. And what it means is that higher education has to transform, it has to change. And so what the Pre-Scholars Academy has done at LSU is that for our campus partners that are engaged in this work, PSA has challenged our own thinking, our own systems, instruction, our support mechanisms. The students didn't change, we changed. And what has happened is that these critical changes like the Summer Bridge Program or, build, or helping students really understand that they can identify with being a scholar and that they too embrace can embrace academic rigor and celebrate academic achievement and work hard towards their academic dreams and accomplishments what has happened is that these this 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 group of students has transformed the way that people see them all around them it was just this past week where i was talking to one of our chair people on on this campus who was who's not even involved with the pre-scholars academy but was talking to me because we're, we're really talking about how we can broaden support for all students who are coming to LSU. And he pointed to the pre-scholar students. And, and his point was, if those students can do it because we increased our level of support and really thought a little deeper about how to reach them differently at the point of instruction, maybe we can take some of those lessons and apply it more broadly. That's the kind of inspirational stuff that needs to happen. But for too long, higher education just hasn't been willing to engage in that kind of deep process. Now, in terms of the timeline, you know, we don't have a lot of time. The fact of the matter is, and all of us in higher education know this nationally, we really have four years. Every projection set that has come out that looks at demographics tells us that in four years, 2025, nationally, there will be a sharp decline in the number of students who, gra who are graduating from high school across the country number one, and number two, the diversity of the educational pipeline coming out of K to 12 that is, is positioned to come into college is gonna be more diverse than we've ever seen in our lifetime. Four years, that's four years from now. Most institutions, and I look at my partners in the SEC and maybe even some of the partners across the state of Louisiana aren't even having this conversation. But we're having this conversation at LSU because we know we don't have a lot of time to waste. This is gonna be on our doorstep in just four years. Man, that's that's uh great if you know with that and, and I'm and I'm thinking back about what uh Dr. Robinson said about you know um the desegregation and, and and the diversity and like how that looks in the future. Um do you think and, and, I, and I'm kind of going off off, but I feel like it kind of flows with what's going on, but if that's you don't fine. mind. Um, I don't mind. Yeah, because because you're saying like in the next four uh four or five years it'll be a more 
diverse culture. Do you think there'll be any challenges with that as well though? No question. And those challenges, what, what it's making college campuses and diversity advocates in higher education like myself to do is to use that as a, a opportunity to expedite this conversation. Again, these students, what Pre-Scholars Academy has shown on this campus is that these students can succeed at this level. We have to provide them access and we have to provide the adequate levels of support. And, and here's the thing, Boo, is that what the national data tells us is that students don't drop out often because of academic reasons. The number one reason why students drop out is because of campus disengagement or feeling a lack of sense of belonging on that campus. They don't belong here. Or, can't, or financial distress. It has nothing to do with, with, with academic ability. And guess what? We can do a better job on college campuses like LSU to fix those things. It doesn't take, it doesn't take moving a mountain to fix those things. So, but it does take intentionality and it takes you wanting to sincerely address issues of diversity on a college campus. But LSU is a public land grant. It is, we call ourselves a flagship and that's great. You know, people love to kind of dance around with, with that label, but we're a land grant and land grants are supposed to be accessible. They are supposed to be the engine in the state that helps students increase their social mobility to go from low, low income to now becoming in, in, in the strong middle class, upper middle class and up. We're supposed to be doing that. So yes, the increased diversity is going to be challenging, but it's not something that we can't deal with. But we have to really drive towards it. We have to be intentional. Right. Um, and, and I definitely want to say something to the, um, the realness of that and how, you know, students not feeling welcome on a campus and leaving these, univers and you, and leaving these universities doesn't just affect them in that moment it's generational because yeah. not just this is not just <clears throat> you know one student this is somebody's future uh father somebody future's mother this is somebody yeah. this is a citizen this is a you know a family member and i'm getting that to say uh my mom went to lsu in the 80s and wow. and when she was there um you know she was a great student, you know, you, hey, she was able to get into LSU as a black woman in the 80s, you know, um, but the thing was, uh, she dropped out. Wow. She she dropped out because there was a white professor that, you know, assigned the essay, and when she turned it in, the professor said that, uh, well, first of all, the, the professor gave her an F. And whenever she asked why, she said, there's no way you wrote this paper. There's no way a black girl wrote a paper oh, wow. like that. And wow. she, she went home crying and dropped out. And then uh, I believe that's when she went to, uh, after a while, she, she went back to school and went to Southern. But the thing was there, what if she had never went back to school? Right. What would my life look like now? Right. What, you know, what what kind of you know, where where would she be right now? Um, you know, so but but she then went on to go to Southern. Then uh, she graduated there and went and got a master's uh, at Southeastern and just has continued to uh, climb and thrive academically. But what would have happened if she had not tried again? So right. it's very important about the atmosphere. I love the work that you're doing because the type of work that you're doing is the reason why I'm able to thrive today. So thank yeah. you. Well, I appreciate that. And, and I'll say this on, the, on that same thought process and from a, different, from a different perspective, but the same process, thought process. My point is, and research also bears this out. There was a research, a research piece that came out two years ago talking about flagship institutions like LSU and the fact that the, the percentage of African-American and Hispanic students across the country who gain access to these institutions is very low, has been historically very low. But the students who have gained access to these institutions, to see the dramatic impact and the change of, of, of the trajectory of one's life, when you get the opportunity to participate at, at these kinds of places like LSU, where 
it, everything changes. And it's not just for that student, but it's that student is part of a family, that family's part of a community, that community's part of a state. Folks, we are in one of the most economically challenged states in the country. LSU has a place at that table. We have to be a solution to those problems. We can't sit around and act like we're a campus on a hill that doesn't want to own those problems. We have to expand our reach. And, and, and to that point, just look at the work. In 2017, when I got here, the, the freshman class was about 17% African-American and Hispanic and, and, and Asian and Native American. Today, we're about 34%. We have grown significantly our reach into diverse communities. Now, my challenge on this campus has been very consistent that it's not just about offering access. That's the easy part. Our job is to support them across that stage and to live out our promise as an institution to ensure that they graduate from here and that they can go on and transform again their family, their community, and the state. That's what we're up to, that's what our challenge is up for. I mean, but this community is now talking in ways that is just drastically different than even I remember in those first six months of my time here. Um, so it's exciting to see. Yeah, thank you so, so much. And, and, and you're right, it's, it's bigger than just the access, it's the drive, it's the hope, it's all of that. Um, the uh, uh, organization I sit on an advisory board for is Cities United, and we focus on uh, violence reduction and we work with mayors. And we say that, you know, we work to create safe, healthy, and hopeful communities. And that hopeful is everything because you can have a safe community. That's the atmosphere, the health, that's the functionality of it. But the hope is the drive in order to make people want to thrive, in order to push for growth. So, man, thank you so much for instilling that hopefulness piece because. You know, I don't know why sometimes people feel like it's not a necessity, but hope is everything, even though it might not seem tangible, but it's everything. Yeah. So and 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 and, and I'll say this about that, and I know that we, we have to move this on, but with these classes that have come in, we had a big, very public debate three years ago um, about whether holistic admissions was the right approach for admissions at LSU. And it was all over the newspaper and everyone said, oh, you're lowering quality, you're letting students in who can't do the work. None of those things were true. None of the metrics for the entering class were lower than historical metrics. The ACT profile stayed the same. In fact, the high school grade point average increased. And we know that diversity increases, as I first stated. But now this, this year's class just posted the highest retention rate in LSU history. And LSU has been around for 160 years. So not only are we bringing in the most diverse classes, the highest number of Pell recipients in our history, the highest low income students ever. So we're providing greater access to students across the state, but they are outperforming generations of students that have come before them. So that kind of stuff instills hope. That's what gets people to start believing like, okay, like we see that these students provided the opportunity and a right level of support can do this work. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I want to make sure that that we touch on these few few points um, b before we go to the questions. Um, so a part of your work is to recognize that students of co color often stay away from PWI colleges uh, and universities because a lack of cultural integration. How can your program help universities in achieving cultural integration? Right. Well, like I said, we, we know that students leave because of campus disengagement and students of color are more predisposed to that because oftentimes they come onto campus and they don't see themselves in that picture that includes them in it. So, again, we have to be very intentional about that. But I'll say this about students participating at PWIs and being a little off put by that in some ways. That's our own fault in college admissions. College admissions doesn't speak well to underrepresented students. Historically, everywhere I've been, I've been at eight different institutions, when I come in and do the assessment as to why they are not achieving the levels of success they want in areas of diversity, I look at their publications, I look at their messaging, it does not speak to us. We don't tell our story well enough and we don't really help students be able to see themselves in a picture of success that includes them in it. But once you start doing that, and you start building a critical mass of students on your campus like we did back in 2018, those students can be part and intricately a part of the change that needs to happen on this campus. They can move forward the agenda by pressing us as administrators by demanding better of this institution. 
And then they can help other new, new students who are being recruited to see themselves as part of this experience and, and be excited by the part that they can actually leave their mark and help transform a historic place like LSU. Again, LSU has been around for 160 years, right? So this is the time where you can leave your legacy and leave your mark on this campus because it's a changing time. What, I've what, I'll, what I'll say about this is that every campus I've ever been a part of, there are structural barriers in place that need to be examined for sure. But the, but the communities of color that I've been a part of um, in, on these campuses, they have a yearning for their day to come. They are champions of diversity. They want to work with our communities. They just need to find a way to get into some of these structural places like enrollment. Enrollment is a place that is very far reaching across the university. Everybody pays attention to what we do because we, you know, the work that we do affects every department on campus. That gives me a bit of a bully pulpit to be able to go around the campus and say, folks, this is what we're trying to do. This is the agenda. And this is how we're going to achieve success. Now, you need to find a way to better support the students that we're bringing. Students are a big piece of that. And I think, I, I think here at LSU, they've shown that they can actually move the needle on these issues. Wow. OK, so in, in conclusion, I know you, you probably touched on this. But but I'll just go ahead and just kind of bring it to a uh, close here with this last question. In working with universities, uh, have you found things that still need to be changed? And what are the remaining barriers? And what would you like to see changed? Listen, that's a loaded question because it's like right. there's so many things that still remain to be changed. And uh, I won't see those things through in my lifetime or my career, I'm sure. But, but I will say that what, what, um, what has happened with COVID in the midst of this pandemic has accelerated. You know, higher education is scrambling right now. A lot of people around the country are, have, did not make their enrollment numbers this year. And that has a significant disruption fiscally to an institution. So this is a moment where disruption is happening and everybody in the system of higher education is looking around to say, how do we make sense of what just happened and how do we move forward? And diversity has kind of been front and center in that conversation. What, what I can tell you is that we really need to focus on what are the structural barriers that are in place at the gate of access. And once and for all, challenge our assumptions about those things and deal with them. I think we also need to figure out how we begin you know, higher education is a real cozy place, man. Like this is a good place to work, right? Like quality of life is good. People come to work in higher ed, trade off high paying professions and other spaces because higher ed is a good quality of life. My point to folks around and I, my colleagues in the, across the country, I say, oh, we're too cozy. We're too cozy and people are suffering because we're too cozy. It's time for us to do the hard things, examine the things that need to be examined and assess those things. Right. Get to the point of are the things that we that we are actually doing in practice, are they working? The way we teach students, are we really effectively teaching them in the classroom? Do we see evidence of that? Do we need to be better? Like these things are critically important. The faculty and the diversity of the faculty, man, that's an issue that exists everywhere I've ever been. We need more folks of color and there are plenty of them across the country that need opportunities to be in the faculty ranks and be in front of classrooms and teaching these young people that are coming in. So, I mean, there's plenty of them, Boo, but I mean, we're going to take the fights one by one and if we all do our, our, our little part to, 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 to challenge what's not comfortable, to get out of our comfort zone and challenge those things. We'll change the world over time, but we'll pass it on to your generation, the younger generation to carry the torch forward and continue on. All right. All right. So um, thank you. Thank you so, so much for for that. Um, just real, uh, real quick, uh, Dr. Delphit, Dr. Robinson, do y'all have anything um, y'all might want to add uh, there? Go yeah. ahead. I yeah, just, ju just one thing is I hope that our listeners will realize the common thread that has flown through the presentations that you heard this morning. It's almost as if we got together, you know, and collaborated to put our presentations together, but we didn't. So that speaks, I think, to the actual existence of what we're talking about. 
Yeah. Thanks. So, so, so yeah. Um, final, final thoughts, Dr. Delpit. Right. I just wanted to read. Oh. You okay? Reinforce what um, Dr. Aviles um, said about the sense of belonging, that that is what has been found over and over the work. There's a book by Claude Steele called Whistling Vivaldi, which is very important to take a look at uh, if you want to understand that, that when people don't feel that they belong, they disidentify with the institution and their grades drop and they leave and they eventually leave. The kids who can leave in college leave. The kids, elementary school kids who can't leave, they just uh, drop out in their heads. And that is this whole notion of find, you have to get rid of people's sense of negative stereotypes about black people and black children and people of color in order for them to feel that the person in front of them believes that they belong. And that's one of the things I think we really have to um, work considerably on uh, both faculties at both K-12 and in universities. Oh man, that's great. Uh, Dr. Avalis, do you have any closing re remarks? I mean, I think I've said enough is that, you know, there's a lot of work to do. There's a lot of work to do. And, and um, you know, when I, that phrase I said, that, uh, status quo is not sustainable, comes from a report that was put out by a group that does demographics for higher education administration across the country. It's called the Witchy Institute. And they, their closing paragraph said very urgently, like higher education has to wake up, like the status quo is no longer sustainable. And, and this country needs greater access to populations to be college trained, and we know they can do the work. It's just our own structural barriers that are man-made, not, not reinforced by research. It's things that are our assumptions. You know, We value an ACT because it's just the way that our culture has been. Our society has kind of been grounded on this idea that that test means so much, when in fact, we know we can move beyond that test and we can assess students even without it. So we got a lot of work to do. And, and just for us in, in, in these spaces, it's just a good time to be alive, to roll up our sleeves and get to work. All right, great, great. Um, And now uh, final statements, uh, Dr. Robinson, you have any final statements? No, I think I've, I've said enough. I just want people to realize that common thread that I talked about earlier that ran or uh, runs right through all three of our presentations. And it all talks about the same thing. Yeah. Um, so I want to uh, thank everyone for, uh, you know, being a part of this panel, he hearing us out, um, you know, giving us uh, a chance. I, I love it. Um, man, the energy in the chat has been great. I've been kind of focused. So I, I didn't see everything in the chat, but I love the energy in the chat. Thank you so much for uh, in engaging. I'm actually uh, going to put my info in the chat if anybody wants to reach out to me. Hey, uh, let's connect. But now I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Torres.